different colors from uh, oranges and pinks and greens and blues and mauves, all mixed at about the same value, though, the same lightness. And what I'm doing is painting different um, pathways of these colors, these big sweeping curves that come from the outside in towards the sun. Um, and starting with the kind of darker, cooler colors of the outside of the painting, um, and those curves get kind of narrower and narrower as we get in towards the sun. And then doing the opposite, coming away from the sun, painting with the lightest, warmest colors out towards um, those cooler um, areas. And what that does is provides like an overall gradation as, as you move in closer to the sun, everything gets lighter and warmer. Uh, and that just really, really helps the glow. All of these various um, big curves of different colors, again, they just encourage your eye to move. Hello and welcome back to my studio. So this is episode, I believe this is episode 31 of uh, Becoming a Successful Artist with me, your host, Tim Packer. So I'm coming to you live uh, via YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And I'm doing a live show every Wednesday at 12.05 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, if you want to get notified when I go live each time, if you subscribe to my YouTube channel and then click the little bell notification, you'll get a notification on your phone or whatever device you're on whenever I go live. Um, and and most of you know me already, but for those of you, if it's your first time watching my live show, um, again, my story is I, I, I dreamed of being an artist when I was a little kid. Uh, I worked towards that, gave up on the dream at the age of 21, did 18 years in the Toronto Police Service, uh, and then quit my job, cashed in my pension to give it one more shot back in the year 2000. I've since gone on to have a very, very successful career. And now my new mission in life is really sharing everything I've learned with people who have that same dream of becoming a successful artist. So today we're gonna, I'm gonna finish up on the ask me anything questions that I got last week because we had way too many questions. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about commissions. So if you have questions during the show, if it's about what I'm actually talking about at the time, if you put those in the chat, Cameron um, will put them up on the screen and I'll deal with them. And if you have questions about anything, about art or the business of being an artist, you can put those in and I'll deal with those at the end of the show. So, um, and one thing you can do as usual, if you just want to give me a shout out, say hi and let us know where you're watching from. Okay, before we get started, let's just uh, see who we've got. So we've got Monica from Denver. Hi, Monica. Welcome back. Leo, good morning from Seattle. Uh, Patty um, from Superior, Wisconsin. Welcome to the show. Heather from Ottawa. Oh, I hope Ottawa is a lot better than it was the last couple of weeks. Hi, Zhao Wen. Welcome to the show. Hi, Ron uh, from Oakville. We've got Stephanie from Ajax. That's just around the corner from me. We've got James from Wales. Welcome to the show, James. Uh, Eileen from Vancouver Island. We've got Sherry from Niagara Falls. A lot of uh, regular listeners or watchers. Susan from Lloydminster, Alberta. Welcome back. Jan from Kentucky. Uh, welcome. Anita from uh, Brampton. Welcome to the show. And Lynn from uh, New Stratton. Um, welcome. So that's your last name, but I did Pardon me, my, I don't have my glasses on. So we've got Jessica from Toronto and we've got Heather. Um, do you ask for initial deposit? Yeah, that's a question that, that I'll deal with when we get into the commissions. Um, Maureen from uh, Nevada, welcome to the show. And okay, so yeah, we've got a good group here already. So I do have some big news too that I'm excited about before we get into the show. Um, and so many of you know the story of Brooke Cormier, the young artist that I mentored about five years ago. Um, and if you don't know about that, you can check out on my YouTube channel. There's a whole series um, of me mentoring her. We filmed every session. But anyways, she went in the space of about two years from, from just leaving school as a landscape architect to deciding she wanted to pursue a career in art. And over the two years that I mentored her, she went from zero to where she had over a, a quarter million people following her on social media. And now just five short years later, um, she, her work is actually selling for the same as mine. 
And like I say, she's she probably the best at social media that I've ever seen. And it has just launched her career. She's just living the dream. Uh, Brooke and I are actually going to collaborate on a course on doing social media. So we just had a big, long Zoom talk on the weekend about this. And we both kind of agreed that, um, you know, I was planning on doing a course on social media and I think it would be great. She was also planning on doing a course on social media. And I think that would be great. But we both agree that the two of us together, it will be a much better course for a number of reasons that I actually have some expertise and had success in certain things that she hasn't yet. And there's some things that I know better than her, some things that she knows better. And also between the two of us, between a young 20 something who's kind of right into all this obviously um, appeals to a certain audience, but there's a lot of people out there like me, less old people who didn't grow up with social media. Um, and again, me coming to the course, giving that perspective of having to navigate all this stuff as somebody who's, uh, well, in my 50s when I started, but turned 60 now, um, the fact that social media is not just for young people. So anyways, I'm really excited about that. And um, we plan on actually launching the uh, beta version of the course at kind of a pre-release discount on the 21st of April. So we've already set the date and we're going to start kind of getting the course together and filming it over the next few weeks. So very excited about that. Okay, so let's get back to some of the first um, Ask Me Anything questions. And so this one was from The Dude. I don't know if it's uh, The Dude from The Great Lebowski, but he had a question about if I could talk about graphic communication and create creative narrative and storytelling. So I'm not 100% exactly what you mean by that, but I'm gonna tell you my, my kind of take on it that is, that in social media or YouTube or whatever, like storytelling in general is a very, very effective way to engage people. So I often do storytelling when I'm talking about a painting. If somebody asks me about a painting, the best thing that I like to do is tell them a story about what, maybe it's about the trip that I went on, where I took the photo, maybe it's about that place or whatever, but about talking, telling a story rather than talking about the art. And also my story, I find that people get very, very engaged with my story. My story is kind of not typical, right? Like someone who was on the police force, quit my job, cashed in my pension um, to pursue my dream, um, and then has had actually, you know, a great deal of success, certainly beyond my wildest dreams. One of my um, most um, engaging posts over the last four or five months it was actually a picture of me. It was a picture of me on the day I got sworn in on the police force. And the 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 um, caption under it is, what's the scariest thing I've ever done in my life? And that was actually quitting my police, quitting my job, cashing in my pension to do this. Um, but again, telling stories is a very effective way to engage people, especially if you can tell a story and teach at the same time about something. So Again, I, I don't know what exactly you are looking for, but that's my take on it. Storytelling is a really, really effective way to engage people. And I'll just get back to Brooke with social media. At the very beginning, all of her social media was about her story, about telling the story of this young girl who had gone, studied four years to become a landscape architect and then came to her parents and told them, thank you very much for this wonderful education, but I don't wanna be an architect, I wanna be an artist, which is not something most parents are keen to hear. And then it was her, her journey um, as she got better and better and as I mentored her to where she is now. Now her, her popularity is because of the quality of her work and her social media presence, but initially it was all about her story. Okay, now we have another question from Jessica, which actually this comes up a lot. Jessica wanted to know if there's like a magic number for the number of pieces that you should have for a show. Um, and and so partly it depends on the size of the, the place where you're having the show, but I always liked to have about between 15 and 20 pieces uh, because I want to have a variety of sizes and price points too. So like 15 to 20 was always a sweet spot for me in terms of originals. Um, and I would have usually a couple major pieces that, that might be like 40 by 60 or 36 by 60. I might have like four or five in that three foot by four foot range and then down to the three by threes and the 30 by 40s. And then I would have more 
of the 24 by 24s and little 16 by 16s. But if you have about 15 to 20 pieces, uh, that that allows you to kind of have a number of pieces in each each price point. Now, obviously, if you're going to do if you're going to be in a bigger um, venue, then you need more. The biggest show I ever had, biggest exhibition of my work was at the uh, Chinese Cultural Center um, in Toronto. And that was at the Sun Yat Sen Gallery. And the gallery was huge. So I think I had about 15 originals, probably about 20 of the big stretch G clays, and then probably 15 or 16 of the small framed prints. Um, but I would say 15 to 20 is a really good um, amount of pieces. So if you're doing a festival, if you're doing an open house, or if you're having a show at a gallery, and obviously if you're having a show at a gallery, you want to you want to confer with the gallery owner or gallery director as well in terms of like what they expect or what their advice would be in terms of the number of pieces and sizes. So that's um, that's my take on that. And then Shirley wanted to know: Is there an app? that that she can buy that will critique her work um and the answer is not that i know of um it would be a really really good app but i i don't know if machine learning is actually to the point where it could do that um but what i can tell you is if you haven't already if you go to my website so the tim packer art academy so that's right up on the banner there if you haven't already if you go there and go down to the bottom of the page and you sign up for my newsletter you'll also get my pdf which is the 10 most common compositional weaknesses that I see in, in aspiring artists' work. So I do a lot of critiques, uh, but that's part of my um, the people who pay for my mastermind course and then become part of my um, Hungry Artist community. Um, so I have a, I have a, a big course be called Becoming a Successful Artist. And part of that is every, every few weeks we get on and do a Zoom call and I will critique um, members' work. But my PDF, just by avoiding these 10 common weaknesses, I guarantee you, your work is going to improve. And that's absolutely free. So again, if you go to my site, put in your name and email, you will get that. And you'll also get the opportunity to um, purchase my color and composition course at a big discount. And, and, and again, critiquing is almost 99% about composition. It's only once we have you've mastered composition that can get into kind of more important, the, the lesser important things, things like brushwork and that type of thing. But the most important thing in any painting is the way in which you arrange the shapes, colors, values, edges, elements in the painting. So again, that PDF will certainly help you. And I, again, the, we've sold over 600 um, of my color and composition course. And the response is just like unbelievable. People have said how much it's helped them improve their work. So that's the whole critiquing. And then Lori wanted to know about how do you get people to sign up to your email list? And that's also that's something that Brooke and I are going to be covering um, in our in our upcoming course. But the the simple way of doing that is, is, first of all, you need to understand some of the terminology. And so you do that with a lead magnet um, and leads are people who actually sign up to you to your email list because now you have a lead that you can reach out to. Um, and, and this is the most important thing I believe in using social media to grow your business um, is that everything that you do should have a call to action at the very least to bring people onto your email list. Or it could be as I've already done today, right? I've talked, I've, I've put a call to action out about my color and composition course, about my becoming a successful artist course, let you know about Brooks upcoming um, collaboration with me. Um, and, and again, the whole idea is what I want people to do though, is sign up to my email list so that I can reach out to them um, next week, six months from now, a year from now, what I did at the beginning of my social media um, journey is I would just promote whatever I had going on right now on that particular social media. But the problem with that is anybody who might be interested in whatever it was that I might have to offer down the road, if they didn't actually jump and buy that thing, then I lost the ability to reach out to them. 
Uh, so the whole idea is, is creating a lead magnet, and that is all about giving people value. People are not just going to sign up to your email list because you want to be able to tell them about shows and sell stuff to them, right? People don't want that. It's very unlikely um, that people are going to do that. You need to give them a reason to sign up for your email list that, that provides them some value. So again, for the teaching thing, that's my that's my uh, PDF for the 10 most common compositional weaknesses. That's a very, very valuable piece of information for someone who's starting out in art. And if you, you join up for my list, you get that. For the, the other part of my business, which is actually selling the my originals and not so much originals now because I'm hardly ever painting, um, but also the, my Gicle reproductions, we have lead magnets going out out for that actually three times a week. And what we are doing right now is every week I feature three different G clays, but just one of each. So there's just three G clays. Uh, and every week I send an email out to my list um, with these, with a link to an online gallery with these three features, and they're at a 25% discount. Uh, and, and so that's the, that's the, the incentive to be on my email list is the chance to actually purchase my work at a significant discount. And then a couple times a year, we'll do like a big show with like a one of everything at 25% off. And if you, if you haven't already, I have a, a, a video on YouTube about that where we will do like $40,000 in sales in a weekend on that. But people want to join my list because they want to have the opportunity to, to purchase the work at a discount. Now, obviously you probably don't have over 80 or a hundred prints that you can do this. So what you can do is you can do little giveaways, but your lead. And, and so here, this is what's really important is your lead magnet needs to target people who would potentially become clients of whatever it is you're trying to sell, whether it's teaching or whether it's artwork. So what you could do is just do little a little print of one of your pieces, mat it, shrink wrap it and say, I'm going to do a giveaway uh, for everybody who signs up on my newsletter this week. Uh, and then you, you post that on social media. And and again, the people that sign up to your newsletter, then you draw one, you send that to them. Because someone who who, who actually likes your work enough that they're going to want a little print, well, they're potentially going to like your work enough to buy one. Maybe not now, but down the road. And that's the whole idea. Well, once you've got their email, if they still remain interested in what you're doing, then you they could be a client 10 years from now. You don't know. But if you're just doing social media and you're not getting people's uh, contact info, you can have all kinds of people view a post. I had one post go viral on LinkedIn. It got over 110,000 likes and 11,000 comments. But I don't have hardly any of those people's information because I wasn't doing a call to action. If I had just put that little call to action um, on that post to say that if you are interested in learning more about my work or whatever, you can sign up to my email list. So you can do that on every post, but then you can do little promotions and lead magnets um, to, to, to draw people in where you're giving them something of value. So I hope that helps. Oh, and I had another question just relating to that. Someone asked me the other day about how often should you send out emails to your list? And it's like, only when you have something to report. So there's no point. You don't want to be pestering people every week if there's nothing going on. So when I first started uh, my career as a full-time artist, I was actually mailing a newsletter out then and like printing it and designing it. But I would only send a newsletter out quarterly. Just let people know, give them some examples of some of the recent pieces that I'd done. Let them know about if I had any shows coming up or if I was doing any festivals or anything like that. But it, it, it's kind of when you have something to report. Uh, and so for me now, um, like those of you who are on my Kajabi, you know, you got an email yesterday saying that I was, I did two live shows yesterday about creating online courses because Kajabi, which is the platform that I use for all of my courses, they had a, an amazing kind of one day only offer where people could get a 60 day free trial. And normally you get 14 days or through affiliates, you could get 30 sometimes. But I thought that was such a big deal. I did two live a broadcast yesterday. So I sent an email out to all my subscribers on my Art Academy to say I'm doing this. And then you also probably got an email this morning if you subscribed saying that I was going to be doing the live show about about this. Um, and so yeah, it's when you have something to report, but but using a lead magnet is is 
that's the way you do it. And you have to provide people something of, of value or a chance of something of value. And don't do, I've seen people do this. It's like, um, I'm, I'm going to raffle off an iPad if you join my email list. Well, everybody would like a brand new iPad. There's no point having people on your list unless they are potentially going to be clients or customers of whatever product or service it is that you're offering. So there's no point having 100,000 people on your email list who all want a chance to win an iPad if 99,000 of them aren't interested in art at all and are never going to buy your work. They're just clogging up your email list. Um, and if you have, if you're going to do this too, you need some sort of a CRM platform, customer relations management. So I know like AWeber or MailChimp are two of the most common I use a Weber. So that's about email lists. Uh, Lynn had a question about how long does it take for water soluble oils to dry before they're ready to ship? Uh, and the answer there is it depends. So with, with water soluble oils, which is what I use, there's a lot of variables in there. So if you're painting into a wet painting medium, which I do, um, then that medium can speed up the drying time. Um, but it depends on how thick the paint is. The thicker the paint, the longer it takes to dry. Not only that, some colors dry really, really quickly. Some colors take forever to dry. So the reds in particular, um, and I think a alizarin crimson is probably the worst. If I put down a really thick impasto uh, stroke of alizarin crimson just by itself, it might take four months to fully cure. Obviously, that's a problem if you want to be selling and shipping your work. So what I use for the water-soluble oils is if, especially if I know, like I have a show coming up and I, I want I want this this painting potentially to be ready to ship in two weeks. Then I will mix um, the impasto medium in with all the colors, and that's all, that's made by Windsor Newton Artisan Water. It's actually a water soluble medium as well. And what it is is ground marble dust that's mixed into the paint medium. If I mix that into the paint, that will speed up the drying time, and it will also, if I'm doing thick impasto strokes, it will make the paint much more stable and much less likely to get squished in. Or even you're gonna have if someone walks by a painting with a sweater, and you've got like the little peaks of the the big impasto strokes that can actually catch and you can actually rip it off the painting or something like that well this stuff's like body filler so when you mix it with your paints it makes them much more stable so again the answer is how long if you're putting in stuff to uh to speed it up like the impasto medium then it could be ready to ship even as as um, as quickly as a week, especially if you're not doing really thick applications. But if you don't put that stuff in, then it could be a month, two months, three months. And I just got in the habit whenever I created a painting, I always put some of the impasto medium into the reds, even if I wasn't doing a really thick um, impasto kind of technique because I just wanted them to speed up a little quicker. I didn't want to have to be waiting a month or two months or three months to ship a piece. Um, Yes, the Windsor Newton water soluble oils can be mixed with regular oils. Yeah, any of the water soluble oils can be mixed with the regular oils, but I, it doesn't Wait, mean. Uh, yeah. Of the impasto, he means. They like yes, it. yeah, the water soluble impasto medium can be mixed with regular oils as well. Um, and actually, any of the regular oils and water soluble oils can be mixed together um, so that, so you, if, because I know a lot of people have, um, a ton of oils and now they want to move into the water soluble but it's like well i have all these other paints here you can mix them together but it doesn't mean you can have half of the paints on your palette water soluble and half of them traditional what you can do is so for example say you're using your prussian blue and you've got prussian blue in water soluble and you've got prussian blue in regular oils when you go to put the prussian blue onto your palette you squeeze out some of the regular you squeeze out some of the water soluble and as long as the water soluble is the majority, so you might do like a, I, th I think they say as long as it's more than 50%. So if you do like a 60-40 split, 60% water soluble, 40% traditional, and then you mix up those two paints together on your palette, that now that's going to be your, your, your Prussian blue you're using, then it should still remain water soluble. You, you don't need to then go to turpentine. Now you'll have to play around with this because I don't do that. I don't have a huge collection of oils, but I know I've seen the manufacturer say this. Um, 
because the water soluble in the oils are, are actually, it's the very same kind of pigment and everything else. It's just that they've been able to get like water molecules in between the, the oil molecules kind of down at the molecular level. And what happens is once that water evaporates, now you're left with traditional oils and they actually dry by oxidation. And so as far as I know, and I've heard, you can't tell the difference once a painting is finished whether it was water soluble oils or whether it was traditional oils. So yeah, you can, you can mix them, but yeah. And there's also things, there's things like cobalt, cobalt dryer, I think Japan medium that can speed up drying times. You just really need to make sure that if you're going to use these, you, you look at the directions because some of these can really weaken the binder to the point where the paint might kind of flake off afterwards. Um, but yeah, how long does it take? Depends. And I had a question from Celeste, which is, how do I find my niche? That's uh, that's the $128,000 question. So that's like, how do you find your style? Um, and I think Celeste said, too, that she's been painting for two years. Um, and she's actually tried to replicate some of my work in acrylic, but it comes off looking a little cartoonish. So that's what we'll do with that in a sec, too. So finding your niche or finding your voice, that's what I like to say. It takes years. Uh, and, and it could take many, 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 many years because here's how the process goes of finding your voice is, first of all, you need to master all of the skills, the technical aspects of creating art. So and again, I'm talking about in the village that I live in, which is where we make our money by selling our paintings or selling prints of our paintings to people who are going to take them home and they're going to hang them in their home or they're going to hang them in their place of work. And that's pretty much it. If you want to get into the public galleries and postmodernism and conceptual work, whole other village, not my village. And so none of this stuff applies to that. But in this village, again, if you want to be able to sell your work, then you need to master all the skills. First of all, you need to master composition. Um, and then you need to spend a lot of time in what's called process mode. And process mode is where you're trying a lot of new things, trying things that you don't know how to do. And that's where the learning takes place. Uh, and one of the best ways to go to use process mode that I like to, and, and I use this a lot, is actually taking courses or buying books or videos or whatever of other artists whose work you admire. And then, you know, take the course to see how they create a painting. And then you follow along and try and create your own painting like that. And you gradually develop um, competence in the skills that they use. You get an idea of how they go about actually kind of conceptualizing. What's this painting going to be? Where do I start? What are the steps? And you do that over time with a number of different artists, as I say, whose work you you look at and go, oh, I'd love to paint that way. Um, and also ideally who are good teachers. And and you spend time in practice mode, which means, you know, if you don't know, if you haven't mastered drawing, then you do a sketchbook and you draw every day. But it's like over time of doing all of this stuff, what ends up happening is then you reach the point where you can create great work with a unique voice. So it shows mastery of skill, mastery of composition. It's a unique voice. When people see it, they know it's you. But what happens is over years of doing all of this stuff, gradually you start honing in on the three things that you need for your voice to actually be viable. So you need to love the process. So you need to actually just be dying every morning to get up and go in the studio and do what you do. You need to love the finished work and the public needs, or at least enough of the public needs to love the finished work. And the only way you do that is by putting in hours and hours and hours and hours and hours in front of the easel. Um, at, at times in practice mode, at times in process mode, and at times in product mode, which is I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that, um, this one, because we're gonna get into product mode when we talk about commissions. When in process mode, should we give ourselves a certain amount of time before moving on to product mode? Yeah, well, at the beginning of the journey, I would suggest you are spending, you should be spending at least 60, 70% of your time in process mode. And you should probably be spending 20% of your time in practice mode. So again, another, another, here's another uh, example of practice mode. Like when I started, um, 
putting birch trees into my landscapes. I didn't actually do that for the longest time because I didn't like the way my birch trees looked. So I just avoided them. And then people started bugging me saying, we'd really, really like to see birch trees in your work. It's like, okay, I guess, yeah, you know, I'm a Canadian landscape painter. Birch trees are important. I need to do that. But I didn't just start painting birch trees. I spent about a week just painting on the little canvas paper, trying different things to try to find a way to, to paint a birch tree that I liked that would fit in with my style. And then once I did that, then, so I was initially in process mode, trying to figure out all different ways of how to paint birch trees. And I also, for that, went and looked at artists whose work I liked who painted birch trees to see, well, what is it about their work that I like? And then it's like, well, how would I maybe paint to get something like that in there? And then once I came up with, with uh, a, a birch tree that I liked, then I practiced it a number of times till I knew that, okay, when I go to move to a painting, now I'm actually going to be able to execute it. And then the very first painting that I did with a birch tree in it sold right away. The gallery owner called me and said, we need more birch trees. But I didn't just start painting a birch tree. Um, again, I went into process mode and then I practiced what I'd learned till I was confident with it. And then I went into product mode, which is creating a painting that I'm hoping to sell. Um, and so, yeah, there's that process going through it. But I, at the earlier stages of your career, you should be spending more time in process because process is where you learn and practice is where you actually hone and groove those skills and concepts that you've learned. Um, so you should be doing a lot of that at the beginning. And the other thing I just need to mention that when you're in process mode, because you're doing something that you don't know how to do, there's a very high um, percentage of failure where, where basically at the end of the day, you're left with a painting that you go, oh, this is a dog's breakfast. I guess this is going out in the garbage. Uh, or I'm repainting over it and painting again. And that's okay. That's what's supposed to happen in process mode. If that never happens to you, you're not in process mode. Um, but again, that's a necessary part of learning. And a lot of artists, what they end up doing is, you know, they, they found a way to do a, a, little, a little bit of competent work and they sell a few pieces uh, and it's great. And then they try something else and it doesn't work. So they scurry back to product mode. The problem with product mode is you never, ever grow in product mode. And so David said, have I sold process mode wor works? I sold a ton of process mode works early in my career. So I'm going to talk about commissions today. And this, this is uh, kind of, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, this kind of dovetails perfectly within with commissions. So the works that you see behind me right now, um, that's the type of thing that I was doing when I left the police force. Now, I'm just going to get Cameron to just take me off the, the, uh, the screen for about 15 seconds. Um, I'm just going to tell you these two pieces. The one on, on this side was actually a commission of two kids and their dog. And the one on the other side, this side is a, a, a portrait of my son, Scott. So that I did for me. So I'll get Cameron just to take me off right now. Okay, so that's, that's the type of work that I did and was doing when I left the police force. Um, and so this actually dovetails perfectly. I'm going to get to that question about process. Did I sell stuff in process mode? Um, but th so the whole idea here today talking about commissions is when you do a commission, you are doing a painting for someone else. You are doing the painting that someone else wants in the way that that person wants it. And it very likely is a painting that you would never, ever paint. Right. And so, again, the piece on the on this side, um, I would never just want to paint two random kids and their one eyed dog. Uh, right. And no one is going to buy uh, just a random painting likely of, of two kids and their one eyed dog. Um, but the client whose children that is they wanted a painting of their two kids and their dog so that's what that's what a commission is is when you're doing a work when you already know who the client is before you start the piece and often you've had discussions with them and now you're doing a piece for that client so let's just talk about some of the pros and cons of of doing that in the first place um oh actually before i do that when you're doing a piece like this this is product mode 
product mode is where the, the sole purpose for you sitting down to paint is to create a painting that you are going to sell, hopefully. And in this case, it's creating a painting for a specific person that that's your market. They are going to buy it or if they don't buy it. There's a very good chance no one else will. Right. And so when you're in product mode, that is not the time to go, gee, I should try. I wonder if I should try this new technique that I just saw on YouTube, or I wonder if I should try painting in pastels. I've never done pastels before, but maybe I'll do that for this um, commission. It's like, no, in, 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 when you're doing a commission in product mode, you just stick with the stuff that you are competent and confident in. And if you do that, you should hit kind of the same uh, bar of quality pretty much every time. Again, the problem with product mode is you never, ever grow as an artist. You don't learn new things because you're only doing the things you already know how to do. Um, so what are some of the pros to doing portraits? I did portraits for about two or three years. So here's some of the pros of, being, of doing portraits. It can be very lucrative. You can charge more for a commission. And then actually, this is not just portraits, but commissions in general. You can charge more from a commission if you want than what you would charge for your regular work. Um, and it makes sense because that person wants that specific painting, right? And also, they are taking your time away from what you might wish to be doing if you were just painting on your own. So you can charge more for that. Um, the other thing is it can be very, very steady work. When I was doing the portrait commissions, it reached a point where I had like 10 commissions backed up. So I, I, I never I never thought, well, what am I going to do to kind of create a painting that's going to make me some money? Um, because I, I had a, a, a line of people who wanted commissions. So it, it can keep you very busy. It can give you steady work. Um, and then the reaction can can be amazing too. I had many people where, you know, when we unveiled the portrait, they cried, they cried because whether it's a painting of their kids or their dad or, or, or their dog or whatever, you know, where they cry and give you a hug and say, thank you so much. Well, that's, that's really, really rewarding as an artist to have your work have that kind of impact on people. So like, those are all the good things about doing commissions. What's the bad thing about doing commissions? Well, you're doing a painting for someone else. Right. Often it's not a painting you would even want to paint. And this the image behind me of the two kids and the dog. It's like, yeah, I would I would never just go, wow, I, I want to paint these these kids. I would rather be painting something else. So it's it's taking you away from doing what you want. The other problem with commissions as well is that if you spend all your time doing commissions, then you don't have the freedom and the flexibility to spend time in process mode, um, which is where you are going to learn and, and where you are going to grow. Um, and then the other, the other downside of doing commissions and this, this particular painting, the reason it's up there is this was, this was, the, this was the one that really just made me say, I'm not doing commissions anymore. So the story here was like, was commissioned by actually a friend of mine referred me to the client because she was looked, she bought paintings off him and she wanted someone who did portraits. So I went and I met the lady and they were very, very well to do. Um, and lived in a huge house right downtown Toronto. And if you know anything about Toronto, like just a, right now a townhouse in the greater Toronto area goes for a million dollars. And this was a property that was probably an acre right downtown Toronto with a huge house on it. So um, money was no object for them. And I thought, wow, there's a great client. I'm going to get get this work in 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 their home, and their friends will see it. Because at this point, I was I was I was thinking I'm going to continue with doing portraits. And so I met with the mother, um, and she said she was doing it as a present for her husband for his birthday. Uh, and I said, well, should we have involved have him involved in the uh, in the meeting about what the painting is going to be and how it's going to be. Um, and she actually called him in and said like, Oh, do you want, and he said, no, I'm too busy. Whatever you do, whatever you want is going to be fine for me. And he had seen examples of my work. So in the consultation, so we did the photo shoot, we did the consult about the composition and everything else. And what the client said to me was, um, I really don't want super, super high realism. Like, and that one is in watercolor. She said, I'd like it to be like a little painterly, especially the background. And so like, I don't want it to look photographic uh, because I did have work. I've had work where people complained when I had like an oil in the show, they thought it was a photograph because I do can do very high realism. So she said, I don't want it to be super photographic, but I want it to be very realistic, but I want it to be clear it's a painting and that it's a watercolor. And so that's what I did. And so we, we figured out the price for the painting 
and then and and the framing so when i had the piece finished i brought it down to show her and she was ecstatic she cried she put it on the the mantelpiece of their fireplace and was just like so thankful and i thought wow this was great two days later she called me to say oh there's a problem with the painting it's not what my husband was expecting he was expecting a much more high realism painting than 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 what you've got more like your super realism is there any way you can fix it and it's like, well, first of all, no, this is a watercolor. It's like, I can't change most of what's there in a watercolor. It's not like an oil where you can paint over it. But I also said, like, I don't know what your husband's talking about. Like, maybe if he comes out to my studio and we talk, um, you know, and I can actually make changes there. And it was like, oh, no, he's too busy um, to come out and do that. Um, and so, and I had at that time a policy, if you don't like it, you don't buy it. I did not take uh, down payments or anything else. So this painting that took me two weeks um, and, and I delivered exactly what the client, which was the woman wanted, I had to go down and pick up the painting and give the check back. And then the worst part there was the husband was there. The, the wife wouldn't even talk to me. She was, I think she was just so mortified and embarrassed about this whole situation. And so he said to me, well, I don't want this to be, you know, I don't want, I want to pay you something for your time. Here's a hundred dollars. It's like, it was a 22 hour or no, sorry, two week painting. It was probably 30 hours in there. And he said, yeah, here's a hundred bucks for your time. Um, and the worst part for me though, was I really needed that hundred dollars at the time. That was right when I was, uh, my first two years when I was only making like 15, 16 grand a year. So I took the hundred dollars and I still have this painting of their two kids and their one eyed dog. So that's the downside of doing commissions. So if you're going to do commissions, if I was going to do commissions, continuing on what I would have done is I would have changed um from that if you don't like it you don't buy it to where people would give me a down payment up front a deposit and then um whether they like the painting or not i if they didn't like the painting i would take it back but i would keep the deposit uh, but when i started out um the big thing that i wanted to do when i was starting out and that's when i was on the police force as well so i already had a high paying job what i wanted to do is to get as much work as possible and to get as many clients as possible um, who were satisfied, who would then refer me. So almost all of my work initially with the portrait commissions, it was all through referrals. And like I said, there were times when I had 10, uh, 10 commissions lined up to do waiting to do. Um, um, and at that time too, I had actually never had a commission refused. And so the one lesson I learned there is who's the decider, right? Who's the person who says, yes, I love this portrait or no, I don't. Because if the decider is not the person you're talking to, I would not take the commission. So in that case, again, going back to that incident, if the husband was not willing to sit in on the meetings, then I would just say to, to, the, to the wife, well, if you like it, you've bought it. You don't, get to, you, you don't get to tell me what you want and have me deliver it and then have someone else say, well, that's not what I expected. Right. So you need to make sure that whoever has any sort of say in whether they accept the commission or not is involved in all of the discussions. And Jessica, that's where I'm going as well. I did not do um, contracts back then. Um, again, because my whole thought, too, was like I'd talked to a number of people who had done who had commissioned someone to do a painting and then they really didn't like it, but they bought it anyways. And they they have it hanging in their house. And every time they see it, it just gives them a bad feeling where they just put it away. And it's like, I never wanted anyone to, to feel that way. And I also thought that if I do my job, I am going to give them a painting that they are absolutely going to love and that they are they would be willing to pay much more for. So that was early in my career. If I had continued on as a portrait painter, I definitely would have had contracts. Everything would have been spelled out so that at the very end, if they weren't happy with the painting, I still got paid for my time. Now, how much that would be, um, again, that's that's for you to, to decide. Um, but let me just look at my, uh, my list here because I've got some stuff. Yeah, so things to consider. Oh, um, and then what, what actually happened to me, when this happened, I was already starting to get kind of just fed up with doing portraits because when I did the paintings, like the one of my son on, where am I here? Nope, there. I would go out and take photographs, often in really dramatic lighting, often in lighting that wasn't necessarily the most flattering and it wasn't cutesy, cutesy pootsy, which is often what people want in, in commissions. Um, 
And, and I would take photos to get images where it's like, wow, I really want to paint that. Like, I just love, I loved painting that portrait of my son with all of that red reflected light that comes up and hits him on every plane that's facing downwards and, and, and all that. So when I started out painting people, I did it because I loved painting people. But what I realized is I didn't love nearly as much painting other people's people the way they wanted me to paint them. And even when I moved into landscape, and I was painting landscapes, you know, people want you to paint their cottage and it's kind of like, okay, that's a painting. I, I wouldn't walk by their cottage and go, oh my God, I have to paint that, right? It's like, no, that's not really what I want to do, but I'll do it because I need the money. Um, and, and so if you are going to get into doing commissions, you have to kind of really monitor that. Now, there are people who love painting portrait commissions. I'm not down on, on painting commissions uh, or people who just do it. The, what you have to decide is, do you love the process? Remember I said, you need to love the process. You need to love the finished product and people need to love the product. It reached a point with me where I not only didn't love the pro the process, but after this painting, it, it just left such a sour taste on my mouth. The thought of going in there and doing another painting for someone else that I didn't want to paint, it just became too big of a hill to climb. And that's when I decided, well, that was a horrifying revelation, first of all, um, because I've quit my job, I've cashed in my pension. I'm a, you know, I'm a senior signature member of the Canadian Institute of Portrait Artists. I was elected to the Canadian Society of Painters of Watercolor, all on the basis of my portraits. I've already built up a demand. And actually, I did one more portrait after this because I still had a backlog. But the last portrait that I did, I actually got $5,000 for. So I was actually just getting to the point where I was getting good prices. Uh, but I just thought this is soul sucking for me, so I can't do it. So I walked away and and decide what do I wanted to do and I realized I wanted to paint landscapes um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more because that that gets into the process but but I do have some other things to talk about with with uh, commissions too so that's the thing if I was to do one now again depending on where you are in your career right if you're just looking to get people get exposure and like I was charging for a head and shoulders uh, watercolor portrait. So, you know, something like, like the one of my son behind me, I was charging $260 framed for that. Um, and that would be about 15 hours of labor. Uh, and so that's cheap, 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 which means, you know, people are just going to leap at the opportunity to get you to, to do a commission for them. When you're starting out, I recommend keeping your prices really, really low. And then as you build your, your clientele and as you build your demand, then you raise your prices. And like I say, over the course of about three years, my portraits went from, um, I was, I was charging $500 for a full sheet watercolor, uh, framed to four years later, a similar size oil on canvas, I got $5,000 for. So your prices can go up as you get um, more and more demand, but it, it's very difficult to get commissions if you don't have the backlog of um, work. Not sorry, not the backlog, but the past history of work, the you know proven track record that yes, people are happy with it. And then again, that, that word of mouth, because that's what I thought every time I did a, a a commission for $260, that's a business card out there in that person's home. Everyone that comes into their home is going to ask who did that. And they are then potentially going to refer more clients to me. So um, where was I going with that? Anyways, let me get back to some of the other things. So if you are going to get into doing commissions, um, oh, I know where it was. But once you get to a certain point where now your work is well known now and, and now it's a significant um, piece of, again, if someone returned a, a commission that I was only going to get 260 bucks for in the first place, I'm not really heartbroken. If they turn down a commission that I should get $2,000 for, then that's going to hurt. So as your prices go up, then I would I, I would think about um, the whole idea of it's not a contract, at least a very, a very clear clear written agreement that says, you know, like, okay, it, it, you know, you will, you might give them a free consultation, but then once I agree to start the painting, maybe they give you 20% uh, uh, as a deposit or 50%, again, whatever, whatever you, you can get. And then I also know that some portrait artists, they also do, they, they will go and, and you'll have to pay just for them to come do the photo shoot or the preliminary sketches. It's like, that's 25%. And then from there, they might work up a number of potential different compositions. Uh, and once the person agrees to the finished composition of the painting, then they pay another 25%. So it's basically 50% down 
um, before the artist actually starts the finished commission. And then when they finish the commission, then it's if they take it, they pay the 50% extra, the, the final 50. And if they refuse it, the artist still keeps the 50%. If I was, was to have continued on doing commissions, um, I would be doing something like that. I wouldn't be spending a week on a painting with the potential of me getting nothing. But when I was starting out, that's what I had to do to build the clientele and to get that, that reputation out there. And, and again, just really, really important is who is the decider? Who is the person who's ultimately going to be uh, involved? Or if they have any involvement in, in whether they're going to accept the commission or not, I would not take a commission on unless they were involved in every step of the process because um, you don't want you don't want to be stuck with the, a painting of uh, someone else's kids and their one-eyed dog for the rest of your life that you spent two weeks of your life on. Okay, so, and now I have, before I get to the whole process thing, I'll tell you what, I, I still do commissions. Um, I don't do portrait commissions, so I won't go paint a scene someone else has taken a photograph of or anything else like that. But I, I do what we call kind of a quasi commission because I often get um, clients that say like, you know, I really love your work. I would really love a, you know, a, a piece in a specific size of one of your kind of motifs that, that you do. And what would happen with me is my work would, would sell so fast often in the galleries that I'd have people saying, I've been coming to your, uh, this is the third show I've been to. And it's like, you know, each time there's something there I would have liked to buy, but each time it's sold before I get a chance to buy it. And so what I started doing is, is this quasi commission where I say to people, okay, well, like reference it to a particular um, 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 subject matter that I've done. So for example, well, I really like the fall scenes with the birch trees, right? With the sun coming, obviously the sun coming through the trees. And I just like something with that, that maybe has some reds in it. And, and that's, a, that's, that's the only kind of uh, input that I will take. Or they'll say, I really love this particular painting or gicle of yours. I'd like something with a similar look or feel to it, but in this size. And if it's something, and, and if if I feel like doing it, I'll say to them, okay, I'll do that. Um, but I just wanna be very clear. I'm not creating a painting for you. Um, I'm creating a painting that I wanna paint that very likely will also fall into what you've just described so that you, there's a very good chance that you might like it. Uh, and then when I'm finished the painting, they just get first right of refusal. I don't take a down payment or anything else because if, if they don't want this painting, then I will just, when I was with the galleries, it would just go out to the galleries and someone else would buy it. Or even now, like I'll sell it online to, to someone else. But, but the thing that I, that I really don't like and what, I, what, what happened when I was doing the portrait commissions and what, and what happens to most of us when we start out, right? We do paintings we don't wanna do. You're doing a painting of someone's cottage or their garden or whatever. And you're thinking, what would the client like? Uh, and that's not, uh, almost never what the client would like is what's gonna make it the best painting possible. What you wanna be thinking is what's gonna make this the best painting possible. And I ran into that a couple of times, even with, um, the, the kind of quasi commissions that I do where I let people have too much input. I remember one case in particular, the client wanted, they wanted the sun through the trees. They wanted, they wanted some birch trees, but they also wanted snow, but they also wanted water. And I put all that stuff into a painting and it's like, oh, you know why I've never put all that stuff into a painting? Because it's too much stuff for one painting. Like it should be about the water or about the birch trees or about the snow. Um, so again, I take very, very little input. And like I say, I make it clear to the client, I'm doing a painting for me that there's a very good chance that you would like. Would I do a midway check-in allowing the client to see the process? Um, well, for me now, again, I'm not doing a painting for them. I'm doing a painting for me. If they like it, they buy it. If they don't, they don't. If you are doing a painting specifically for that client, though, where it's like their kids or it's a painting of their cot, of, you know what I mean? You're creating, they know exactly what the finished painting in there. They already have a picture in their mind of what the finished painting is going to be. And now you're trying to create that. In that case, yes, I probably would. Certainly before I go to do the painting, even when I did the um, was doing the portrait commissions. Now, I had a digital camera at that time. I was an early adopter. I had a thousand dollar Olympus camera that was a one megapixel, um, but it was big enough 
the, the files were big enough that I had enough to paint from. So I would go do the photo shoot. I would, I would kind of review on my laptop with the client, but then I would go home and using Photoshop, put together kind of a mock-up of how the finished composition was going to be and get their approval before then moving on to the painting. Um, but that's because at that point too, I was very high realism painter. They knew from looking at that mock-up what the finished painting was going to look like. Um, but if it's if it's something where it's a little more kind of they're not 100% sure, then yes, I, I, I would certainly not rule out the potential of actually partway through the process, getting the client's feedback. Um, and again, if you like that kind of thing, that's fine. I just found for me that like, I didn't quit, quit a job that I really liked where I made a really good living and had a solid pension to then follow my passion and let my passion turn into me doing stuff that I didn't even want to do. Um, so yeah, I would definitely do that. But let me talk now about process mode and about selling works in process mode. So you can see here that I already had a very highly developed skill set um, when I was doing the portraits. And I'd also by that time really thrown myself into composition and had a really good sense of composition. And then when I said, okay, I want to paint landscape, the only thing I knew I didn't want to paint portraits of the landscape. So I was in process mode for about two years um, and I still took on the odd portrait commission because again, it was, it was good money, but for two years I was all over the map. So I did, I painted in oils, I painted in watercolors, I painted in casein, I did pastel, I did collage, uh, I painted on panel, I painted on canvas, I, I, I painted on paper, I, I did everything and almost every stylistic approach you could think of and in every medium that you could think of. Now, I don't have hardly any of those paintings. Um, I just have bad examples of the ones that actually didn't sell. Uh, but because I had a really high skill set already, and because I had a really good sense of composition, everything that I did was pretty good. And it was certainly good enough to sell. And especially at that point for like a, uh, I think I was charging for a, like a half sheet watercolor landscape, about $300 and for a full sheet landscape, about five or $600. Um, and so it wasn't hugely pricey, but it was still good because again, I, and again, that's why I say that's how you find your voice. If you haven't developed the skills and you haven't developed the compositional sense, it's like the chances of creating a painting that that looks masterfully composed and, and masterfully executed that makes people go, oh, my God, I have to have it. That's like that's like a, a blind squirrel finding a nut every once in a while. But if you want to be able to consistently do it over and over and over again, then you need to have the skills developed and you need to have the compositional sense. And then during that two year process, I, I really paid attention to, OK, well, which which painting process do I really enjoy the most and which ones also do I love the finished work more and which ones seem to really resonate with the public. And then over time, you start, I used to say to people, um, I had one friend of mine, he asked me if I was mildly schizophrenic, uh, another artist, because he said, every time I see a painting by you during, during that period, he said, it looks like it's been done by another artist. And I said, yeah, that, that's, that's intentional. Um, and I also had a lot of well-meaning artist friends tell me that I needed to pick a niche. And it's like, and I just said, no, I'm not there yet. I, ha I don't, at that point, I hadn't created anything in terms of my voice that I thought um, I could make a successful career off of. So I could have picked a niche and I could have done okay and been one of those artists, you know, who forever is just making 15 or $20,000 a year. But I thought that's not going to be good enough. If I can't get to the point where I'm earning a decent living, my wife is going to insist I put a suit on and go get a job where I make a decent living. And so for me, I just intuitively felt, and it turns out I was right, that I need to keep searching until I find the thing, the voice where I love the process, I love the work, and then the public loves the work. And I used to say to friends, well, like, I think I'm heading in the right direction. And then people would say, like, how's it going? And it's like, well, actually, I think I'm in the right neighborhood, you know, I'm on, and then it was like, I'm on the right street. And it's like, I think I'm really close to finding where I want to plant my flag. And when that happened, 
um, my life changed. I, the, the type of work that I do now, minus the sun, the, I didn't have the sun in the work initially, but that very graphic um, style of painting, one of the galleries that I was showing in, and again, most of the galleries that I was in, they had me there as a portrait painter. And then they were also showing my other stuff. Some of them were, some of them weren't. But when the, the first kind of iterations of my current style kind of came out, um, I had one gallery owner who just said to me, he said, Tim, this is it. He said, he said to me, you're about to get on the, the uh, shaft of the hockey stick. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, every successful artist, creative, doesn't matter whether you're an actor, you're a singer, you're a music band, a painter, filmmaker. He said, the successful ones, when you look at their career, it's a hockey stick. That the first few years, their earnings go up slightly like this. And then as soon as they find their voice, you're on the shaft and it goes up exponentially. And he said, you're about to move from the blade to the shaft with this work. Um, so he convinced me actually to, to go down and do the Toronto Art Expo. He said, you need to get this work in front of people. He said, I think it's phenomenal. And that weekend I did $27,000 in sales and that changed my life. And that then launched my career that I basically did that style. Just, it's just gradually kind of evolving and becoming more mature to, to where I am now. But basically for the next uh, 17 years, that's what I did. And that's what has given me an amazing living and an amazing life as an artist. But if I'd stopped too soon and said, oh, I'm just going to pick a niche and then try to market. That's the problem most artists do is they they think it's all about marketing, right? Here's what I do. Now I need to market it. What you need to do if first, and again, first, but it might take you a year, it might take you five years, is you need to find that voice where people say, oh my God, I love your work. I do, we do posts every, um, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday with our features and I answer every comment, but every post that I do, there's at least 10 people that say, oh, I love this piece or I love your work or whatever. If you're not getting, oh, I love this, um, then you're not there yet. And especially if you're at a festival or at a gallery show, if people are not saying, oh my God, I love your work, then you're not there yet. It's not a marketing problem. It's not an email problem. It's not a social media problem. It's an art problem. What you need to do is hone the skills, um, um, master composition, and then spend time in process until you find that voice where you love the process, you love the work, and the public loves the work. Once you do that, earning a living as an artist is incredibly easy. Then the only question is, how, how much do you want to scale it? Are you happy with making thirty, forty thousand dollars a year? You want to make fifty. You want to make a hundred. You want to make a quarter million dollars a year. That's then where business things get into it. But until you reach that point where that's the reaction and people are willing to pay you um, what you want, and I would say that thirty thousand dollars is kind of the um, that's where it shifts from the the blade to the shaft. Most artists, I'd say, well, a, re a recent study in the U.S. showed that it showed that 80% of full-time artists made less than 10 grand a year. Half of them made less than five. So you need to get to that point where just doing your originals, you are able to paint enough and sell enough where you're making around 30,000. Once you hit that, then I'd say, then your, your earnings are going to go up just because you won't be able to keep up with the demand, just where you're showing your work already. And then again, as you look at business um, solutions to scale your earnings, it can go to the moon. Um, but yeah, so in answer to your question, almost all of that stuff I did in process mode, I sold, but stuff that I did before I'd mastered the skills and mastered uh, composition, that stuff went to the garbage heap. Uh, so, and again, if you're going to be selling your process work, you need to have a benchmark of quality to say this is, it, it has to be at least this good or it doesn't see the light of day. Um, and that obviously goes up over time. But you always have to realize too that you might become, you know, very, very accomplished and very, very famous. And you are then going to be going into the homes of usually friends and family who are earliest supporters who have versions of your early work when you first started selling. And you have to ask yourself, do I really want to go and see this particular piece 10 years from now um, hanging in someone's home? And I, I do have a few cringy moments at times when I, friends say to me, oh, look, we have your piece over the fireplace. And it's back from when I was still in the police force. And, and before I got very skillful and I think, oh man, I, 
I hate the thought that people come into their house and they say, oh, we have a friend who's an artist and here's what he did. Because the people that see that painting, they think that's where you are now. They don't realize, well, that's before you were, were very good. Um, so do we have some questions, Cameron? How's the comment? Okay. Uh, Oh, thanks for Zoltan Zabo. Uh, yeah, I so Zoltan had a huge impact uh, on me. Um, first of all, by his books because he was the uh, probably the first really good good instructor in terms of books and articles about painting and watercolor and and, and about kind of a personal style. Uh, and he developed so many of those techniques that, that are now common in watercolor. Zoltan, Zoltan actually invented them. The idea of using stiff bristle brushes, the whole kind of using a credit card to scrape out rocks and all, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but what I learned most from him, actually, I was, I was fortunate enough in the last couple of years of his life to attend two of his workshops, uh, week-long workshops uh, in Bob Cajun in Ontario. And I learned more about composition just because when he painted, he would give a running monologue. He would say things like, okay, and not, he, he would, he would give a running monologue, not only of, of composition, but also it's like, okay, this area of the paper here now is just dry enough where I can get a really good background. So I'm going to take my rigor brush with a little bit of water and, and do a few negative shapes to, to background in order to say, well, this is, this is still a little too wet. Um, and so I'm going to wait a minute here, but then he would say things like, well, you can notice that I have all this red up here, but in this quarter of the painting, we don't have any red and that's disrupting the unity. So I need to add some red in here. Um, and just listening to him do that, uh, each each workshop doing five demo paintings, I learned more about composition than I learned in two years of college uh, taking graphic design. And I also saw for the first time, people talk about painting in an organic way, where it's almost like it, it's a back and forth between the canvas and the artist, and particularly in watercolor, where, you know, for oils right now, I put a mark on, the, when I go to put a mark on the canvas, I know exactly what's going to happen with watercolor because um, all you can do with watercolor is have a reasonably good idea of what's likely to happen, especially if you're playing in the wet and wet or particularly in that it's not wet and it's not dry. So depending on how much water you have in your brush, you might be, and how much pigment, you might be a positive, it might be a negative, might cause a back run, all of that kind of stuff. Um, you do have to react with what you get uh, and, and it's not exactly like, you don't know exactly where it's going. It's a journey. And when I started painting, um, if you've seen any of my examples of the, of the watercolors where it's involving negative shapes and it looks almost like stained glass, that was that I was fully in that mode of just starting wet on wet and gradually carving shapes out. But yeah, Zoltan Zabo, I have, I think I have every book that he's written, um, but if you love Zoltan Zabel, so here's something um, you may or may not be aware of him because I talk about him a lot. There's a friend of mine by the name of Sterling Edwards. Uh, he's an instructor down in the United States. So he does live Zoom workshops. He actually, before COVID, was like teaching all over North America, probably like almost every week he was out teaching a workshop. Um, people fly him all over the country to, to, get, to get him to teach. He... he was fortunate enough that he lived near Zoltan and Zoltan kind of took him and I under his wing, even though I didn't know him as long. Zoltan took a real interest in both Sterling and I, but Sterling, because he lived near him, he used to go painting with Zoltan like almost on a weekly basis. Um, and, and Sterling picked up so much from Zoltan and then Sterling's gone on to actually invent some of his own techniques, he even has his own line of brushes, his own palettes. So if you love the, the, the teaching of Zoltan Zabo, Sterling is like the ability to get that same experience from an instructor live now. Um, and he's a brilliant teacher as well. And he's all the, re the reason that, that I actually got to meet Sterling is when I was taking a workshop with Zoltan. Um, and actually the woman that ran the workshop was a good friend of mine. So I got to have dinner with Zoltan at her place. And um, it's like the second day Sterling says to Willa, his manager, who had this deep Southern accent, he's like, Willa, who does Tim remind you of? And she's like, oh, Sterling, of course. And I heard all about this this double of mine that was down in the States. He was an ex-police officer. He'd quit his job, cashed in his pension, and he was trying to make a living as an artist as well. Um, and just Sterling just said, yeah, we reminded, I reminded him so much of Sterling. Zoltan. No, Zoltan, yeah, who did I say? 
Sterling. Okay. Well, yeah, Zoltan said that I reminded him so much of Sterling. He said, you two have to meet, which we actually did. And that's, there's another funny story. I took a workshop that Sterling was teaching. So when Zoltan passed away, Marilyn, the woman who used to run his workshop, she brought Sterling up to teach the course, um, at, to teach a watercolor course. So I came and took the course. Um, and by that time, I was actually pretty accomplished. And I was doing those kind of stained glass paintings um, that, that were actually starting to get some traction. And Sterling came over to me at, at the beginning of the second day. And he says, what the heck are you doing here? And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, you shouldn't be taking a workshop. You should be teaching workshops. Um, and I said to him, well, oh, I, I do teach workshops. But I said, I know. I said, I came here because I want to meet you because Zoltan spoke so highly of you and Marilyn too. And they said, you got, so I, I just, I thought this is a great way to meet you. I'll come and take your workshop. And he and I then ended up becoming very good friends. Um, and we've gone away on painting trips together. Um, but yeah, if you're looking to take workshops in watercolor, Sterling Edwards, I cannot over, over recommend him. He's, he's amazing. Um, and he's doing live on zoom. You can also get videos of his, he has two books out too, I believe through Northlight books. Um, do we have any more? What's the title of the book that I found helpful? The best book that I've ever gotten is Frank Webb's. It's called Strengthen Your Paintings Through Dynamic Composition. Um, and 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 I'm I'm thinking I might do a book down the road, but you know, obviously Sherry, Sherry's part of my mastermind class, so you have access to my color and composition course. But I also, I like books too, because in a book, I can just go to that specific page and see what it is that, that I want to get. Whereas in videos, you got to go through and find the thing. But when I was learning composition, I had, I would reread that book every six months. Um, but I would read it in little, like that's when I had my morning coffee, I, for 20 minutes, I would, would read part of the book and then go through it um, and then start trying to apply that to my paintings. And then six months later, I would read it again because you cannot take in all of composition all in one go. You take it in in little bites until then that becomes an intrinsic part of how you compose. And then it's like, OK, now I can take in a little more. Now I can take in a little more until you reach you reach and i'm actually going to do a video on that you reach the level of unconscious competence that is you are doing stuff and reacting to stuff that's happening on the page without even having to to go through the thought process you're just you're just doing it because you've become unconsciously competent and you only get there just through repetition 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 and in particular repetition of the 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 content and the teaching so again for me by reading that book over and over and over and over again every time i read it it reminded me of the stuff I already knew and some of the new stuff stuck. And then the best way to really master anything is to teach it. And once I started teaching workshops on color and composition, then it needs to be like right here, top of mind. So that now, I shouldn't say now, when I go to, if I, when I go back to do a painting, I've actually got a couple commissions to do. It's going to take me a while to get back up there. Uh, where all of the stuff is always kind of just like the, the the little ping pong balls when they when they're drawing a number, it's all there ready to be used. You don't have to go, oh, hang on, what was that rule about unity? You just know, oh, that this here is disrupting the unity. And you also know what you need to do to fix it, that type of thing. Um, but yeah, that just comes through repetition. And another thing that that you will find very helpful is when you see other artists work. Um, so whether it's online whether it's when you buy, buy books or magazines, is, is trying to critique it. And, and critique doesn't mean find what's wrong with it. Critique also means when you see a painting that just blows you away, um, then, then it's like, okay, what has the artist done compositionally? How have they um, designed this? How have they created a path to draw my eye here? What have they done to engage me out here? And you look at it and you try to think how, how, has the artist done this? And then also critiques are when you see paintings and it's like, well, there's something wrong with that. Well, what's wrong with it, right? Trying to critique them on your own because then you're exercising those compositional muscles, which means it's much more likely that you are then going to, first of all, create great compositions right off the bat. But during the painting process, if anything is not working really well, you're able to self-critique on the fly. And then at the very last, um, whenever I finished a painting, I would just put it aside for a day and then go look at it with a fresh eye and critiquing it um, 
And there's one last thing I'll, I'll talk about. It's like, when is a painting finished? Because, you know, I, I know artists that have to have a painting. It's like, I've been working on this for six months. It's like, oh my God. Like for me, I want to get in, finish a painting and get out. Um, but for me, a painting was finished when there was no longer anything that bugged me that I had to fix. And when there was no longer anything that I, that I was reasonably sure if I do this, it's going to make it better. Uh, when I reached that point, the painting was done. Now, could it have been better? Of course. And here's the thing that often happens in a painting is there's maybe a particular passage in the painting or section that's not, that's not your best. But then you have to ask yourself, if I go in to change this, am I just going to make it worse or do I feel reasonably confident I'm going to make it better? And if I didn't feel reasonably confident I was going to make it better, then I wouldn't touch it. Uh, and I only have almost every painting that I look at of mine now. Um, I know there are things that could have been done better, but I also know that it had to have been done better the first time. Um, going back in, trying to fix something often just destroys the freshness in a painting. And, it, and again, it just, it makes that little, it's like taking that little uh, drop of red wine and turning it into a giant pink stain. Um, so if there's no other questions, oh, well, we got a couple of Cameron saying, okay. Does it matter the materials you're painting on? You've been doing a lot of process on acrylic paper. Uh, well, it, it just, it, it's, it's that, Painting on a different surface is a different is a different process and will give you a different um, product at the end. But when I was heavily involved in in process, I was painting on watercolor paper mainly for the reasons of the cost. Right, watercolor paper is much cheaper than buying a canvas. Not only that, watercolor is it's a much faster uh, medium. The, the paint dries much faster. Uh, and the paper has two sides. So if I, a lot of my process stuff, if the painting didn't turn out on the one side, I would turn it over, do a painting on the other side. And then I also used, so if you're painting, if you're creating works on paper, then chances are you are then matting and framing them and framing watercolor paper. You shouldn't just like put tape on it because the painting expands and contracts with humidity and it can actually tear away or fall down. Um, also tape is, you want to make sure you use an acid free tape. Um, but what you could do as well is you could create little mounting strips using watercolor paper. So if I was using, for example, 200 pound paper, the paintings that didn't turn out, I would cut them into strips. If I, if the front and the back both were dogs breakfast and it's like, okay, I can't sell this. I would cut the watercolor paper into strips and then you use two strips of paper. Um, you have one that sits next to the painting and then the other one that's a little wider that, that overlaps it, that creates like a little shelf to hold it in. And then I would, uh, and using two sided tape, I would put those together and then I would use those to mount the, uh, the watercolor painting to the back of the mat. And the great thing about that too, is there was nowhere where any adhesive was touching the paper because it was just being held in by this little, little pocket of, again, you've got the thickness of the paper, so it's exactly the same thickness. And then you've got another uh, piece of paper that overlaps maybe that much. And so you've got that little window that's holding the paintings in. So yeah, I did a lot of my process uh, stuff on paper. By the time I moved to Canvas, um, that was mainly because I was doing outdoor festivals and just realized that like watercolors do not travel well, uh, and particularly frames don't travel well. And when I was just doing painting on the canvas um, and painting the sides black, I didn't need to worry about framing and the paintings were much more durable. Ryan, so I don't know if I know that artist. I'm not sure that was me that... Uh... That recommended him. Ryan Sobkovich. No, I, uh, Mike Svob is an artist that I, that I recommended. Uh, but I don't know Ryan Sobkovich, but uh, I'm glad you found an artist that you like. Anything else, Cameron? Okay, so that's it. And so again, just want to remind you, uh, for those of you who don't already, if you want to get my PDF, the 10 most common compositional weaknesses, just go to timpackerartacademy.com in your name and your and your email and you'll get that sent you'll also get an opportunity to buy my color and composition at 50 percent off um, and for those of you who are really really serious about a career as an artist and you don't know kind of where to go i have a free 
uh, webinar online. You can go to www.aspiringartist.ca. You can watch that webinar. It's about my 10 keys of selling your work, but the first five keys are actually about how to get work that people would actually want to buy. That's in terms of developing your skill, finding your voice, all of that kind of stuff. And that will also then give you an offer where you can get into my mastermind course at a big discount. And then for those of you um, that are also, again, you're, you, if you like my content and you, and you, you, you are serious about it, um, but you want something that's more kind of bite-sized um, and you don't want to have to wade through the 180 videos that I think I'm probably at about 180 or almost 200 on YouTube now, I'm going to be doing a live webinar uh, in about a month on the business of being an artist. And that will be kind of an all in one from start to finish. It's going to be a paid webinar. I think it's going to be $89. But if you're on my newsletter list, you'll get it for 69. Now, I did one of these last year. It was very popular. We had almost 100 people uh, on it. Um, and the presentation is going to be about two and a half hours. And then I'll stay and answer questions as long as needed. In the last one, it was like over three hours of Q&A. So that's going to be coming up probably in about a month where you're going to be able to get Again, you won't have to watch 180 hours of my content and pick out what you want. This will be everything from kind of start to finish about the business of being an artist all in one presentation. And then you'll also have access to rewatch that as many times as you want if you take it. That's it. Okay, so thanks. I will see you all next week.